We have a very special guest on today's episode. Today, we are bringing on an all-time great Charger. Sean Lights Out Merriman is coming on the show to talk about his excitement for the 2023 season. You are Locked On Chargers, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Chargers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up and welcome into the Lockdown Chargers podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Wade, joined as always by my co-host, David Drogmeyer. We've been covering the Chargers together now for seven seasons, but this is our fifth season as a host of the Lockdown Chargers podcast, bringing you your team every day. Thank you guys, as always, for making us your first listen. And to make sure that you never miss the show, make sure you go follow for free on YouTube and listen wherever you get your podcast from. David, we have a very, very special guest, someone you've been working a long time to try and get on the show. So excited, and that's why you got to make sure you subscribe to YouTube so you don't miss episodes like today, because Sean Merriman is coming on the show to talk about Kellen Moore, who he thinks is like the most exciting hire of the offseason around the NFL and his connection with Justin Herbert, and just his thoughts on Brandon Staley, who he would steal from his 2006 roster, the 14-2 and two team, to put on the 2023 team, and we'll also get into much more, including the hilarious story into how he got his nickname and how he talked his mom into letting him get a tattoo of a light switch on his forearm. But we did go a little short with him. So at the end of the show, we'll talk about Tom Telesco speaking at the NFL owners meeting, and getting into an offensive line shuffling with Zion Johnson moving to the left side of the offensive line. But here he is, Sean Merriman. Well, today's special guest needs no introduction. If you're a Chargers fan, unless you're a very recent one, you know who we have on today's show, a very special guest. Sean Merriman is joining the show before something really cool he has going on because he's getting ready for Lights Out Extreme Fighting, Lights Out 9 at Burbank Marriott on May 6th. If you guys can, go to it live. You can get your tickets at lightsoutxf.com, and you can also watch it live at 4 p.m. Pacific time on Fubo TV. Sean, thank you so much for coming on, man. We appreciate your time. You got it, man. Finally. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate that. Oh, of course, man. I'm excited. I'm, I might have to try to go out to Burbank and catch that one. I've been super into MMA lately, and I'm very excited for everything you have going on. Seems like it's really cool. But I know you're excited about the Charger season. You're one of the people that's out there, one of the media members that's always talking about your excitement with them. And I've heard you talking on other shows about how excited you are about Kellen Moore. And you called it one of the biggest coaching moves around the league as far as things that were done during this offseason. So what makes you so excited about Kellen Moore and specifically pairing him with Justin Herbert? I think you just said it right there. It's, it's the pairing, man. Um, you, you look at some of the some of the, the struggles and some of the problems or concerns they may have had on the offense side of the ball last year. And it's basically, you know, they come across sometimes as too conservative, but they're not opening up the offense. Uh, wide enough you got you got guys like a Mike Williams and Ken Allen and Palmer I mean you uh, Everett you got guys who can hurt you all over the place so it, at, at a certain point in time you feel like all the weapons aren't being used and what Kellen Moore has been great at doing in his career even when not uh with a lot of options and talented wide receivers he's been able to open up the offense and that's what we've always needed um, so my excitement level is through the roof because we know we have an offense that can put up 30 plus points for you at any given time. Now it's time to go out and do it. Yeah. And now you, you feel like you have the right guy to be able to control all of those weapons that you have at your disposal. Brandon Staley's had a roller coaster for his first two seasons, uh, but the players seem to really love playing for him. Um, but the fans kind of seem like he's on the hot seat. What are you, your impressions have been of coach Staley so far? Let me tell you about it. Everybody that's not the owner is on the, on the hot seat every every year when you're not performing. I mean, it's, it's just what it is. Um, and, and the NFL is a performance-based business. You either you do or you don't, or they find somebody to come in and do it. Uh, fortunately, you know, they have the people there. They have the pieces to the puzzle to go out and get it done. So they're not. it's not one of those things where you have to go out and start to rebuild, right? It's nowhere close to that. That's where you want to stay away from because you know you're going to have some years of not, not playing well. That's not the case. The pieces of the puzzle is there. Now it's time to put everything together. I think the first thing they, they did was by bringing Kellen Moore, and that, that was great. You know, they they made some uh, moves on the defense side of the ball. Um, you know, they went out and got Kendrick as well. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sad personally to see Drew go because Drew yeah. was my guy. Um, but, you know, happy for him that he'll get he's, – he's at a place where he's at least uh, – it got what he's looking for. Sure. 
but uh, more importantly, man, I think the right pieces to the puzzles were, were, were made. Um, and I expect to see a very, very explosive offense this season. And for me to be happy about seeing points on the board and offense, man, you know I got to be extremely <laughs> happy about uh, the direction where the, the organization is going. Especially as, you know, one of the best pass rushers in Chargers history at your, in your time. I mean, one of just the best straight-up defensive players in history. The reason I wore 56 when I was in high school, I mean, you're a legend to so many people out there, especially in Southern California, me included. And the Chargers have a group of their own kind of explosive, legendary edge rushers in their own right, Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack. How much of, you know, this season's excitement is just trying to see those two back on the field together a little bit more? Uh, you just said it. Uh, it the the – both of them, we know what they can do. They, they've done it time and time out. Um, you know, I, I'll tell you just a quick funny story. Me going out and and, uh, and coaching this all season for the day, they had me out there in training camp, and it was a blast. But I knew it wasn't too much. I can go and tell Joey Bosa, and, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, Khalil's uh, been around the block a few times. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, it's, it's not very few things you can go out and teach those guys. So I was mainly working with the younger guys. The key is having those two guys on the field at the same time. That's that's what it is, you know, because we know what both of them can do. But what happens is they're so great at what they do. If they don't have one another to compliment, it was, what's going to happen? The guy's going to get double teamed. And that's what happened to Khalil before he got here when he was in Chicago. He didn't have no one on the opposite side of him. So he and, and sometimes he, he disappeared and, and even some cases got injured because he just didn't have help. When these two guys are on the field together, it is, it is an offense worst nightmare. It is an offense worst nightmare because you don't know who to block. Any one of these two guys can go up and take over a game at any point in time. And then when they started to fix the interior lineman, when they started later on in the season, play better than the interior line, uh, D lineman, the whole defense changed. And so I'm just looking forward to now both of those guys been on the field at the same time. The coaching staff that they made on the defense side of the ball, um, you know, by upgrading some guys and giving them a better position. Uh, if you're not excited, honestly, about this year coming, for one, I'm going to tell you how this thing works, guys. When you got an offense that's putting up 30-plus points a game, you got a defense, uh, guys who can rush the edges, who can get after the quarterback, a lot of points, a lot of sacks, a lot of turnovers, it all comes together. We are going to get right back to Sean Merriman and hear about which player he would steal from the 2006 roster from the Chargers, that 14-2 team. I'll give you one big hint. It's a huge player. But before we get into that, I do need to tell you guys that the tournament is heating up right now and there's no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. And we know big, big games this weekend. You know who I'll be rooting for for sure. But right now, guys, FanDuel is giving new customers a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 as if not already the best time to bet on sports right now of the year. Now you get even a special offer. All you have to do is go to FanDuel.com slash lockdown and sign up today to claim that no sweat first bet where even if you lose, you can win with FanDuel, and you can wager on everything from the money line to point spreads to which team will be cutting down the nets. All on the app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. I'm so excited about it and a lot of great things. Even, you know, football futures on there, draft stuff. There's so many different things you can choose from on FanDuel, including the same game parlay, which is really a game changer. So don't miss out on your guys' shot right now to get that no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. When you join FanDuel today, just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. Make every moment more with FanDuel. That's what we thought we were going to get when Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack first got teamed up. We just did not get the chance to see it enough. But kind of going back a little bit in time here, you played on one of just the best Charger teams of all time in 2006 with Phillip Rivers and LT and Antonio Gates, Sean Phillips, Jamal Williams, and many other just Chargers greats. If you could take one player from that team and put them on the 2023 roster, who <laughs> would that be? I would say uh, I would say Jamal Williams. Love that. Yeah. I, I, would, I would say Jamal Williams. You got those two outstanding linebackers that they can brush the passer. You put Jamal Williams in there, and it is game over. <laughs> uh, because Jamal Williams was so important to to my career, especially because he just ate up so much space, and you could not uh, avoid him because he was taking up two people. Uh, I knew that nobody's going to be in a step up pass rush, so I can just get up the field and pin my ass back and go. And you just felt confident with, with Jamal being on the field. If it was one person I can add to that defense, it would be Jamal Williams. They would that, that he would do wonders uh, in this in this day and age in this game. 
Yeah, I mean, you guys had a ton of great players. I mean, Antonio Gates would fit nicely, I would say, as well. LT, obviously, would be hard to, you know, turn down on this roster for sure, especially with Austin Eckler maybe going into that Darren Sproles role that they had him in last, you know, when we saw that. But last thing, I do want to talk about the lights out because you do have that coming out. Lights out nine, super excited about it. And let's tie it into the Chargers, right? I have heard you talk about how MMA is one of the things you talk to a lot of former players about being able to find a you know a way to channel that you know outlet that kind of competitive nature that you have so much that just comes to a screeching halt when you stop your NFL career right there's just no way to kind of feel you know feed that high again and you've talked about getting guys into MMA but when you're looking at this Chargers team if you had to take one of those guys and who are who's the guy that you're looking at and saying hey if that, when that guy gets done I'm trying to get him into lights out Honestly, it, it would be someone like Derwin. I mean, it has to be right. Der- yeah, Der- 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 Derwin. He's such a freak, freakish athlete, dude. Like, you just know, a predator. Yeah, just a predator. You can put him anywhere, and, and he's gonna be scary, right? And the last thing you want to see him in in the MMA cage, where he can use that explosion and, and his uh, his uh, ability to move around and do so many things. You know, I I play with a lot of great players uh, in my in my time. I played a lot against uh, against a lot of great players. I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody like Derwin ever. And so if I actually Ooh. got a young Derwin uh, to not play football and come come right over to MMA or as soon as he retired to go and try his MMA, I'm probably sure I can turn him into a champ. I mean, hey, he's lean. He's got the length. He's explosive. I mean, I don't know how much you're, you know, you're looking for other than that. I mean, fighting ability, though, you never know until somebody's in that cage. Respect to anybody who locks that cage behind him. Last thing, I don't know when the last time you read your Wikipedia was, but there's a story on there. We have to know if it's true or not. How did you get the nickname Lights Out? <laughs> my uh my sophomore year uh oh my first sophomore year in high school at frederick douglas high school in prince george county maryland uh knocked out four kids in one game and <laughs> oh man what happened was and this is pre-social media pre all sure. this stuff whatever, so i had about 20 students come running to me saying man you knock these guys lights out and i just looked at everybody and said yeah you know call me lights out i didn't you know <laughs> It just kind of came out. I, I didn't really expect for it to be anything. So we got to, I got to school Monday and I uh, got my book bag in my back, my books in my hand. I'm walking to class and everybody's walking around saying, good game, lights. And I, and I said, hold on, lights? So it, it kind of word of mouth got across the school already. So I went <laughs> home. I ran home. And right after school, um, I'll never forget. My mother was in the room. She was smoking a cigarette. I was waving all the cigarette smoke. And I said, mom. Everybody's calling me lights out. I want to get a lights out tattoo on my right forearm. And she looked at me for about five seconds and said, boy, close the door and get the hell out the room. That's what she said. Uh, and so me being me, every day for two weeks, I would not leave her alone. She, she let me go get this lights out tattoo on my right it's forearm. The light switch. The yeah. light switch. And so that's how the lights out dance got created because my first big hit at the University of Maryland, we were playing Georgia Tech. I had a big hit against a, a wide receiver coming across the middle, and I just pretended to flick the light switch on and off. Now, the crowd got hype, right? Everybody got hype, and the stadium got loud from the hit, and it got loud me doing that. And I just started kind of jumping a little bit because I got hyped too. <laughs> That's and, so awesome. My coach, Ralph Friesen at the time, the head coach, he yanked me out of the game. We got a penalty. I came off the field late, and he said, if you ever do that again, you'll never play here. And so I got to the sideline and my teammates, my coaches, like hitting me up against the head. They said, uh, what was that? What was that thing you did? And I said, it was a, that was a lights out dance. Just made just right on the spot. Again, wow. I just threw it out there. And uh, that's how the, the lights out dance and, and the name was born. So awesome. Hey, man, we'll definitely have to try to get you back on when you have more time. But Sean Merriman, founder of Lights Out Extreme Fighting, has their next fight, Lights Out 9 at the Burbank Marriott on May 6th. And you can check it out on Fubo TV or you can check it out live and get your tickets at lightsoutxf.com. Thanks, Sean, so much, man. We can't wait to get you back on. Hey, we got to have you guys out, man. Be my guest. I'll bring you up in the cage. You know, just step over some blood. Whatever we got to do, it's going to be a big show. We got the best up and coming fighters in this sport, man. And I'm Go. just happy that they come to Lights Out Extreme fighting to uh, let me get behind them and promote them and help them to that next level. And guys, Absolutely. you're going to see in the UFC soon, right? I heard you talking about we, that. We like, these about, are the up and coming guys. Least, we got at least four to six guys and, and, and women on this card that uh, it's going to be pretty hard for me to, 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 uh, to maintain and, and keep them there because they're, uh, they're very talented. They're going to get down. They, it's going to be a brawl. I'm telling you, this fight here is going to be one of the biggest we had. Get your tickets at lightsoutxf.com. If you don't have Fubo, make sure you get Fubo TV, Fubo Sports. It's going to be live.
Well, another very, very special thank you to Sean Merriman for coming on the show. Sorry we couldn't get him longer, obviously, but hey, man, what's great stories he brought on for us, and we're definitely going to be getting him on again soon. I'm going to go up to Burbank at the Marriott and go to the Lights Out 9 just to make sure, you know, we can get that connection and get him back on here. And, you know, watching people punch each other in the face is always a lot of fun for me, too. But, David, there is more we want to get into today, including Tom Telesco's thoughts from the NFL owners meetings. He gave out some insight when he talked to the media. Not a ton. Brian Staley gave away a little bit more. But Tom Telesco, obviously not a time of the year where he's trying to give up too much information. I'm sure we'll hear again from him before the draft, right, when things start to heat up a little bit there. But... We did learn some things, and he did actually break a little bit of news because he did say that Zion Johnson is going to be moving to left guard instead of playing what he did as a rookie at right guard, which I thought, you know, he did very admirably. But, David, it seems like after, you know, what we've seen in a couple of years with Brandon Staley where he's been hesitant to kind of move people around and shuffle up this offensive line for chemistry reasons, now it seems like they're very willing to put Zion Johnson at left guard and now put Jamari Sawyer in at right guard. Yeah, and I think part of this decision here is trying to get Zion back in the position that he's most comfortable with. He played left guard his entire college career, did it extremely well. I mean, we know what he is capable of doing. He is a mauler. He's very, very intelligent, very, very strong, and he just fits better on the left side of the offensive line. And I think with Jamari Sawyer, he is such a luxury because he can move around and he moved around in college a lot. He played tackle. He played some center. He played some guard. He just moved all over the formation. So you feel really comfortable with his ability to move around and you want to get the best version of Zion Johnson so you can get the best version of your offensive line. Yeah, and this is from Daniel Popper who got some of the quotes from Tom Tolesco and he said, Tom Tolesco said, get our best five at the spots we think they're best at. So what does that say? It says that they think Zion Johnson is going to be better at left guard you know, than he was at right guard, which I think is fair. I mean, he hasn't played left guard at this level, right? So he's going to be going up against some different kind of players, maybe more three techniques, depending on which teams they're playing on. Maybe that changes things a little bit. But, like, I think you should be very happy with the progress that you saw from Zion Johnson in year one, especially considering he was playing a position, right, that nobody – that he'd never played before. Jamari Sawyer, I think – it's not as much of a sticking point to put him at left guard because of the flexibility you talked about, right? Flexibility. Like – He's so good and has been such a chameleon wherever you've put him on that line that you'd rather make Zion Johnson comfortable. You'd rather see if, hey, maybe there's another level we can get out of Zion Johnson. Maybe we can expedite the process of him growing in this league at left guard. And we're not worried about Jamari Sawyer because the most important Jamari Sawyer thing is just that he's moving to guard in general. And not only that, Daniel, but now you had him playing against, you know, alongside one all pro in Corey Lindsley. Now you move him to the (laughs) other side and you got him playing with two all pros with Rashawn Slater at left tackle and Corey Lindsley there in the middle. So you can't get much better than that. Yeah, hopefully. Right. I mean, you have to hope those guys can gel. Uh, it'd be a, probably a little bit different too. Like if Jamari Sawyer had been playing left guard all last season and not right. left tackle, right? If it was Matt Filer that had gotten hurt and missed the entire season and it was Jamari Sawyer and Rashawn Slater building that chemistry all season long, I don't think this move gets made. Right. I think they would have had, yeah. you know, Zion Johnson probably already moved there, but I think when you're looking at it, it, the only thing that's tough is you breaking up a really, really good right side running game that they found when Trey Pipkins and Zion Johnson were both on the field and healthy. That was a strength for them. Now we'll see how it goes with Jamari Sawyer. I'm going to put my money on Jamari Sawyer and a healthy Trey Pipkins, I think is going to just be better than anything we saw in 2022 anyways. But now just looking at it, David, I mean, you go left tackle Rashawn Slater, right? You go left guard Zion Johnson. Corey Lindsley at center. Then you go Jamari Sawyer, Trey Pipkins on the right side. Like, obviously, we don't know how it's going to mesh together yet. But sure. knowing that you're going into the offseason and training camp and all of these practices with that, I think, is a huge kind of relief for them. I think it's a huge advantage for them to kind of have all those spots figured out this early on so these guys can talk and get together and kind of start working on some things. I mean, if you know Rashawn Slater, he's doing pass rush, you know, pass pro reps in, like, Cabo or something like that even when he's on vacation so I I really really like the sound of that five though David having those dudes locked up I think just is such a luxury especially when me and you have been covering this team for seven seasons right so like this is probably the offensive line I've been most excited about since we started covering this team 
it's because it's the first offensive line that's already been set in stone before the season starts. There's been so many different combinations. Yeah. We've been looking for a left tackle. The Chargers have been looking for a right tackle. They've been looking sure. for somebody in this in the middle. You just haven't had any kind of time to actually build an offensive line to have the chemistry because they haven't been together long enough. Now this is such a rare opportunity to get all of your guys in place. You know where they're going to play. You have them under contract for multiple seasons, and you can really build one of those dominant offensive lines that can truly be a difference maker. That's what you hope. And, and, and Staley talked about that a little bit too, right? When he was talking about Kellen Moore and just saying like, hey, you know, that's what I want our offensive to look like. When they had... Cooper and Gallup and CD Lamb. They had a good offensive line. They had a good running game. Like, that's kind of what we're trying to replicate. We want to have that here, too. And the fact that the offensive line can be a strength. I mean, even yeah. going back to last year, David, the Chargers full blown went into the draft with no plan at right guard. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, they, like, it was get a right guard in this draft or bust. You know, maybe they circle back around and try to pick up like O'Day or somebody like that right. or Bushi on the back end. Who knows? But they went into the draft needing a starting right guard. That is the luxury of this offseason, right? Even though you're a little bit more strapped, you don't have that glaring need to where you feel like you where you feel like you need to take a guard in the first round, right? Or you yeah. have 17th overall pick on it. Like you have a little bit more flexibility this year because of the investments. And credit to Brandon Staley, right? Because Staley is crediting, you know, John Spanos and Tom Telesco for investing in the offensive line. When in reality, right, we never really saw those investments pay out when it was Tom Telesco pre Brandon Staley, right? Yeah. Since Brandon Staley took over two first rounds, two first round offensive linemen, right? Yeah. Going inside and Corey Lindsley was like his number one thing on the docket after he took over as head coach. Which has proved to be a brilliant agency. move. A truly brilliant move. Corey Lindsley, what can you say? I mean the I depth mean, is phenomenal. Obviously has to be addressed. It's something yes. that is is not where it needs to be at this point. And that is something they are leaving themselves kind of going into the draft needing. But Brian Staley also talked about too, David. Hey, there's some guys you're not thinking about when you're thinking about the depth of that offensive line. Foster Sarrell being one of them, right? Zach Bailey being another one. Guys who are undrafted free agents that stuck around as depth pieces. I don't even know if he mentioned Hymas. Maybe he did mention Hymas, but it didn't seem like he was the guy first on his mind, that's for sure. But yeah, it's gonna have they're gonna have to add to it. But the nice thing is, too, is like half of these dudes are at the O-line masterminds with Duke Manyweather. So yes. seems like they're in good hands. And that dude has produced results. So, I mean, it's not a bad thing to see more of your guys that you feel like have been exposed to the game, like Foster Sorrell. And now you get him in the hands of Manny Weather, who has done just great work with Rashawn yeah. Slater and, you know, with uh, other members of the Chargers offensive line. Trey Pipkins, just a huge example, a big feather in his cap. So, you know, the guy gets results. So, you know, it's a great yeah. thing to see. And credit to Foster Sarrell, who isn't making what these other guys are making. And I'm <laughs> That's sure it's at least a pretty penny to go out there and work I'm out sure. with Manny Weather, right? So credit to him for trying to improve his game. The nice thing is the Chargers kind of have that swing tackle if they need it. Yeah. With Jamari Sawyer, right? Maybe you invest more on the interior, get more guard center type players, find Corey Lindsley's long-term replacement, things like that. But I thought that was interesting news from the Chargers. I don't think it's going to be a big deal. I mean, these dudes are all good players, and I think will sure. be good players for the Chargers no matter where they're playing. It's not a, it's such a big move that it scares me really about what the chemistry no. is. And I think as long as these guys stay healthy, which is a big if, they'll be able to build new chemistry. More good news, though, David. Tom Telesco, when talking about some of the injuries on the team, did bring up J.C. Jackson. We said was, according to Daniel Popper, he expects to have J.C. Jackson for the season, which I think would change kind of how you look at at least that position group going into the year. Oh, for sure. I, I mean, the biggest question here is obviously this is a very, very serious injury. So what version yeah. of J.C. Jackson are you going to be getting? And how long is it going to take before he feels like he is truly 100% and he can go play free? and not have yeah. to think about being in pain and just go out there and be what he is capable of being, which at his peak is simply one of the most dominant cornerbacks in the NFL who has, you know, a just tremendous ability to take the football away. If the yeah. chargers get that version back and mix him in with already great corners, like Asante Samuel jr. And Michael Davis, that would be a very, very scary secondary to pair with Darwin James. Yeah, and it, the way Brandon Sealy talked about J.C. Jackson, too, it made it seem like we never really saw the real version of J.C. Jackson, yeah. even when he was in the lineup last year right. in real games, right? Because when he talked about him and how good he was, he talked about training camp last yeah. year, where, I mean, I was at training camp, you know, 
five, six days of that. I mean, he was really, really good. If you listen yeah. to Popper, guys like that, the beat reporters were raving about how good he was. Didn't translate once the season started after he got the little heel surgery or whatever he got. Like, yeah. But hey, credit to that dude too. Credit to, you know, Foster Cyril, Zach Bailey trying to get better in the offseason. Credit to JC Jackson for every time I see him, right? He's busting his butt he's to sweating. get back on yeah. the field, man. Like it seems like that dude is grinding and there's no there's no give up in him. And that's nice to see because you don't really know how players are going to react to, you know, potentially career ending injuries like that. And the, yeah. a lot of the way, you know, you come back from that is how much work you're willing to put in. Good news is it seems like those questions have been answered because it looks like J.C. Jackson has absolutely been putting in the work. So credit to J.C. Jackson. It totally changes the com complexion of this Chargers defense if he's out there and also playing at a high level because you pair him with Zante Samuel Jr. and Michael Davis, the cornerback room doesn't look like something you need as much help with right later on. Michael Davis going into the last year of his contract, but it's hard to even factor J.C. Jackson into it. If he can come into the fold and actually play really well, that changes everything from a short and long term perspective and makes it, you know, a lot harder to potentially move on from him him after this season, which is where basically all of his guaranteed money ends. The Chargers have some flexibility there. So this is a huge season for him, and him being good would be absolutely gigantic for the Chargers. But that is gonna wrap things up for today's show. Thank you to everyone, truly, for checking out today's show. And thank you to David Drogemeyer, the guest booker extraordinaire for staying with us and maybe trying to do it the hard way and finding the easy way at the end, but finding a way to get Sean Merriman on the show. That was a lot of fun, and I will absolutely make sure we get him back on to, you know, expand a little bit more and have him on a little bit longer. But make sure you guys check out the, you know, Lights Out Extreme Fighting League, and you can check out LightsOutXF.com to get tickets to that May 6th fight in Burbank. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm definitely going to be there, so make sure you guys check that out. And thank you guys for checking out today's show. We really appreciate it. To make sure you never miss a show like this, though, in giant interviews like this, Subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast from. And follow us on all of our social media. You can find me on Twitter at DanTalkSports, David Drogmeyer on Twitter at DrogTalkSD, and the show's page at LockedOnLAC. You can also find us on Instagram at LockedOnChargers and on our Locked On Chargers Facebook page as well. You guys can also call into the voicemail line for the next fan mail show, maybe fan mail Friday this week. If we get there, and you just can call in to 323-524-7924. If you get your 30-second voicemail question in there right, we should be able to get it on the show, and we appreciate you guys always contributing. Can't wait to hear what your guys' questions are going to be. But thank you guys again, as always, for making us your first listen. If you need a second listen, make sure to make it Locked On NFL Scouting with the Draft Dudes from free agency to the draft, salary cap management, and more. Join NFL experts Kyle Krabs and Joe Marino as they take you through what it's like to build a successful NFL franchise every Monday through Friday. Find the Locked On NFL scouting same places you can find this show with the draft dudes wherever you get your podcast from and on youtube part of locked on podcast network your team every day but good news is guys it's not the end of the big interviews because i've been bearing the lead we have another big interview tomorrow we have damian parson from the locked on nfl draft show coming on the show works for the draft network as well and he's going to tell us who the ideal pick for the chargers is at 21 and so much more very very excited to get some draft content out and figure out which players we should be pulling for to end up in lightning bolts but we will be back with you guys tomorrow until then take it easy and go bolts <laughs>